What's up, Dawn Nation? Here's a quick question for you. Why do you need a super solid drop? Why does it need to be a strong drop? Can't you just have a weak drop, a weakling drop? A little, little teeny tiny drop thing? Can you have that? It's a good question. It's a great question. It's a fantastic question. Ben, it's a good question. <laughs> So we're gonna be answering that question and a whole bunch of others in this week's episode of In The Daw with Ollie James. So with that being said, let's go ahead and cue the unforgettable cinematic intro video, unless you're on the podcast, then you're just gonna enjoy the drop, super solid drop of the song by Ollie James. What's up, Don Nation? My name is Wyatt Troy. I'm a music producer much like yourself, and I want to welcome you to this week's episode of In The Dom. Now, if you're new to the series, awesome, fantastic, welcome, bro hug. So it is a series where we interview huge music producers. They come and dissect their songs in real time so that you can learn from people in the music industry that have already made it, that are already making songs that are proven, that are working, so that you can learn those strategies and apply them to your music. So if you want to keep learning from huge music producers so that you can, number one, get better at music production, number two, make a bigger impact with your music, and number three, finally make a living out of something that you're actually passionate about, go ahead, hit the subscribe button that's right below this video, and hit the little notification icon so that you get notified every single time we release a new piece of content because we release a lot of content. We got other series, we got other things going on. So make sure to hit that as well. So now the big question is, how is this week's video going to help you on your music production journey? That's a fantastic question. Like I mentioned in the intro, we interview Ollie James. All right, we're gonna be breaking down his song, Moving Too Fast. It's already had an enormous amount of success. Seriously, here's all the success on the screen. <laughs> But for sure, you are going to walk away with these four points that you can completely rely on, completely rely on them. They're the most reliable points you've ever had in your life. Number one, we're gonna be talking about making melodies with MIDI packs. Is that okay? Is that an okay thing? Is it cheating? Is it sanctioned by the EDM Council of Reality? We're gonna be talking about it. The second thing that we're gonna be talking about is mixing your songs to get them ready to be played in DJ sets, which is really cool. Now, just to clarify, we're not talking about mixing in DJ sets. We're talking about mixing for DJ sets, like actually mixing inside of your DAW, getting it ready so that you can play it inside of a DJ set. Third thing that we're gonna be talking about is how to make DJ friendly intros and whether you should do that or not. Okay, this is a very important thing. If you want other DJs to be playing your songs, you want them to be playing it out to the hundreds of thousands of people that they play to on a yearly basis, then guess what? You need to know how to make intros so that when the DJs hear them, they're like, oh yeah, this will work perfect in my set and then just throws it in there. Now, if you don't make DJ friendly music, that's totally cool too, but it's still a really good piece of information to know. Fourth thing that we're gonna be talking about is the thing that we talked about at the intro of this episode, which is why do you need to have a super solid drop? And how do you do that? What is the formula? The do's, the don'ts, the things that go into that? We're gonna be talking about all of these things in this week's episode. So Don Nation, I hope you're freaking pumped for this week's episode. And just so you know, this week's episode is sponsored by the Zang Griffin Zodiac Masterclass. So Zang Griffin and Don Nation, we came together and made this huge masterclass. We break down his entire Zodiac album, which went on to get over a hundred million streams. He breaks down every single song, every melody, every sound, every everything inside of there. And currently we have a launch deal going on with it right now. It's 50% off. So if you wanna check that out, go ahead and head on over to Daw Nation. Net. There's also a link down in the description for that course, all right? So this week's episode is sponsored by that, and I'd highly encourage you to go and check that out. So let's go ahead and ask Ben to introduce us to Ollie James and to take us in the dock. So let's start from the beginning. Let's start from the very beginning. What was, what's the intro? What's the Elmas in the intro? How'd you come up with it? Let's start from the very, very start of your journey. Uh, maybe, maybe I should start with this right here, which is the, the version that the vocalist sent me. So the vocalist is a guy named Harrison, who's worked with David Guetta, Hardwell, and, and, and a lot of great people. So he sent me this idea. It's very it's very squash here, but you'll hear that it's, it's not EDM. It's not my kind of sound. So this is the original idea he sent me. So this is like really vibey and like the real UK sound, but it wasn't something that I could play at a festival or a club. I couldn't go to Asia and play this kind of thing. I had to make it a lot more EDM to appeal to a wider, a wider market and basically my fan base. Instead of starting at the intro, what I, I do is I start with the drop and then my intro is a copy and paste of the drop minus a few elements and plus a few elements. So there's a little a little treat for you. If, you. if you struggle with your intros and outros, it's just a copy and paste. It includes some different elements, take some elements out because all the bass elements are from your drop anyway, your bass line, your kick, everything like that. So 
Whoa. Um, so you start with should, the drop. Yeah, always with the drop because my, my music style, a lot of EDM, the drop is the, the USP. It's the unique, unique, unique selling point of that whole track, right? If you don't have a good drop, unfortunately, the track's overlooked. If I don't have a good drop, what's the point in making a good breakdown? From when I started producing, and this is how I started, every single time I've just done this. So when I get a sick drop, I can use influences from the drop in the breakdown. And the whole process becomes like, that's why a lot of people say that I, I work really fast. I wrap up a song in like six to eight hours usually. That's that's pretty much it. But as you can see here, I had a lot of help from uh, the vocalist Harrison. He's a great producer as well. I had a lot of break elements already to work with. So you, you got the vocal from him. And then you're like after you've kind of sussed out, it's like, okay, I need to kind of create a new-ish version, right? because you didn't like yeah. the old world version wasn't really vibing with you. What's the first steps after you've determined that? How do you start building the drop immediately? Very like step one. Basically, it's a it's a remake of an old UK garage song. I don't think a lot of people know that. I used to listen to it a lot. So we already had this hook, this thing that Harrison actually remade, the plugs, which is these. You'll notice that from the song if you if you grew up in the UK or know or know of the track. I, I took his melody from the drop, these plucks, because I thought they were really sick. I think when I heard that, I was like, yeah, I'm super inspired now. But I knew that I couldn't make a drop with this. They're just not hard enough. I took that, took that dun, 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 from his MIDI and basically just grabbed Nexus, the most EDM um, VST out there and then got up the most EDM sound I could find, which is called Fat Lead, believe it or not, uh -huh. from the EDM four pack. And I took out those da -da 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 notes from the melody because they were very future house, very deep house. Uh, and I came up with this. It was the same essence as the organ, but it's a little bit different, a little bit more snappy, a little bit more big room EDM, and obviously kept his bass line, so I kind of had this kind of feel. So I've got a catchy melody that can be like sung back by the crowd that it's very easy for them to latch onto. But it's, it's not very EDM, it's not very hardcore right now. It's, it's very soft, so that's when the bass line came in. Still working with just one lead, trying to get the whole feel of the drop first. This is the way I sound design. I'm not the guy who'll spend 24 hours working on one sound trying to get it the way I want it. I'm just not that way inclined. You know, I, I prefer to get things out on, on the workspace rather than sit and perfect this thing. You know, I prefer to take lots of sounds and lay them. This is all about taking that one sound and finding the things that really complement that sound. So this one is a plug that I think is just next level. It's got such a nice attack to it. So I knew this would give me the click on top of the lead that I needed. But I will say it's very ugly by itself. But you'll hear the, the, the attack, the transient on this is just, it's just perfect for EDM. So you can hear it's kind of the same kind of vibe. It, it's not completely different fighting for the space. The next one is Serum. This is a reveal, a revealed preset actually, which is the label I ended up releasing it on. I assume this one's not the nicest either. Yeah. That, <laughs> That I underestimated that. That's disgustingly. Uh -huh. But in, in the mix, it just gives this extra like grittiness, I guess. Yeah. It's it's probably a lead which I could have left out, but it's it's a creative process that I decided to keep it in. And the next one is Serum again. This is called It's Revealed, so another revealed sound. I should solo it because it's been a while since I looked at this project. A little bit future house, like a little bit soft. And this is called Fall. This is a preset from Seven Skies, which I grabbed from Splice. This is a solid sound. I think it really, it really helped develop this main lead a little bit more. It's bringing a little bit more of a mid presence to the lead. So, so far we have this sound. Uh, then we have the final two, which is two Spire layers. I don't think they're gonna do too much to the sound, but they will completely it and round it off. So that's pretty much it for the sound design. Uh, I knew I wanted an EDM lead. But I didn't want the standard one that everyone has. I didn't want to just have one thin layer. So I tried to develop my own lead by taking lots of other people's leads and putting them together. And that's pretty much how I designed my sounds. 
So that's what you first did. You got the main league going. I know that you've already showed like kind of like sub layer. What was the next elements that came in? Well, the, the next element has to be the base. All this extra little fancy stuff, the ear candy stuff comes later on when you've really got that killer idea. Like I sent this to Harris and he's like, yeah, the idea is really good. The direction's good. So I needed something a little bit raw, like a little bit rough, the, the, the harder EDM sound. Because this isn't usually my style. Like a lot of people actually didn't like it in the end because they thought it was too soft. It's a bit progressive house, but big room inspired as well. So I had to get something like that my, my fan base would, would recognize. And this is where this bass line came in. Again, I think I, this was just a day where I really love Nexus. Uh, I think this is the main sound. <laughs> And then all these other layers are just ones that, again, complement that sound and aren't completely different. They all kept the same kind of sound. Another kind of rough sound there. And this one, this one was a little bit of a dirty sound, like a, like a bit crush kind of layer, but I knew it would sound good in the mix. I've EQ'd it slightly different. And the same with this one, I believe. So they were a little bit different to the main sounds, but I've EQ'd them differently. So it, it co makes this complete sound, like this one's a bit louder, I think. But to me, this sounds boring because this bass note is so long it doesn't change it's the it needed to have something different about it so i thought what can i do and this is where the pitching comes in and it just creates a tiny bit of movement especially when you've got the lead and the bass line also pitching as well So it becomes a little bit more interesting and less boring, you know, when you've got these long bass notes. Uh, in progressive house, you tend to have the rolling bass line, the, 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 this kind of thing. But because mine was just dead flat, I needed to do something a little bit different to it. So there, there we had the basis of the drop. And then all the other stuff that comes in and is just ear candy after that, right? Yeah, I mean, you obviously need a kick drum, right? So I don't know if I actually started with this kick drum. I know it takes me a while to actually find the perfect one nowadays. I still haven't found one that I truly love. But I found this one. This one has been used in a lot of my tracks it's like when i struggle to find one this is the go-to from the jordy daz pack i'm not sure if it's still on spice kick number two as you can see no eq and i thought it just has a great body didn't have the greatest of clicks or attack but it had a great body And obviously it's EDM, so it really has to slack through the mix and it really has to be the driving point of the drop. So then when we add the click, I found the top kick from Kashmir, another one that I use. I don't like to leave it completely full because I feel like this top kick is too long. I wanted it to be a little bit shorter. So in FL, I just use the out button here and pull it up to halfway. Yeah, and it's a really, it's a really sharp one. I just exaggerated the volume so you can hear how sharp and, and clicky it is. And then it's now about what do I want to do? Do I want to make the drop big room and have the four by four claps? Do I want to make a future house and have the, the two two and four clap? And that's why I decided to do the future house kind of vibe, which a lot of my fans actually hate me for, I think. So it gave a different groove and it's something you can also dance to rather than just, you know, rage to. So the first one I found was this tiny little clap. Obviously not really punching through the mix, but it was a really nice layer to this one. So now it's got a different feel. It's big room meets future house meets progressive house now, in my eyes, because I brought in th those elements as well. To keep the EDM feel, I wanted that. Sometimes I'll use a cheeky bit of crowd noise and EQ the lows out of it. Sometimes it can be a little bit messy, but if you really want that festival vibe, I like to do that a lot. But these claps from Kashmir have that kind of noise in the background. And obviously I chopped the, the loop at the end where there is no baseline, so everything gets chopped there. I have these 
little claps. These are all just little ear candy things which aren't necessary but really do make the stand out, stand out from the other tracks on a label, for example. You'll hear like a reveal track and then you'll hear the, the lower label tracks and you'll hear that the reveal track has just a lot more little details which people overlook. And speaking of crowd noise, I actually had it in this one as well. Just a nice filler for the mix. It, it just, it really helps drive the track and give it energy. Baseline, I wanted to, because this dun 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 dun, it has the potential for a lot of attack and transient on the baseline. So I wanted to add something to that to make it even more attacky and clippy. So it's like a really saturated bass sound. Just a one shot that I just uh, uh, duplicated and put in the different keys that I required. Again, I just shortened it a little bit because I felt it was too long. Other things within the drop that are important, so the claps, the effects, is the white noise is, is a definite, it's a definite um, important thing for EDM tracks. What I have discovered recently is in Kashmir's new pack, uh, the clean down sweeps work a lot nicer. These are still a little bit grainy and distorted, but the newer ones in his pack, the, the clean down sweeps work a lot nicer and, and don't muddy up your mix. These, you have to usually EQ them and, and get rid of the lows and stuff like that. I have some bass stabs as well, following the bass line. And then we've got these cute little uh, vocal chops. which just play the same notes as a lead, but within Nexus, it's a preset called Vocal Cuts, and you can play, it basically plays different tones and different vocal sounds. So it's nice for intros as well. I just thought I'd put something a little bit cute for the, for the Spotify listeners, you know, something a little bit nice to the ears, and it makes the complete drop. So that's pretty much it. And then the fill, I feel the fill is very important. Because it was an old garage track, we try to make garage themed breakdown, but it didn't work out. So I got this garage loop and I wanted to get this in the fill. So it had that same feel from the original track because I, I've remade a lot of songs, released a lot of covers, and I think it's important to implement a lot of the sounds from the original track. People can relate to it a lot easier. The first question I have is, so like your overall workflow from what I've seen so far, it's basically number one, you always start with the drop. And the first yeah. element that you start in the drop with is the lead. So the main thing, playing the melody, come with yeah. the melody and then the sound design that's behind that melody, you layer it together and all that kind of stuff. At which point yeah. you layer the lower end to that. And then after you kind of like have this big solid lead, so to say this big solid sound, then you move down to the kick, snare, yeah all kind of like the base elements. And then on top of that is when you start adding all the ear candy. Is that kind of the overall structure of how you build a drop? Yeah, sometimes, you know, sometimes I'll find a crazy kick sample and I'll make a 150 drop where it was just a side trans bass and then it's different, it's different rules. But for this kind of drop, which I've been making this style of big room for probably like six years now, I've grown into this structure. When I am inspired, the more inspired I am, the quicker and the better I work and the more crazy stuff that I actually do. Like I'll, I'll use plugins that I never used before if i know this song is going to be is going to be signed or it's going to be a hit for example so when i really start to feel the idea everything just falls together it's usually yeah get the lead right at the end maybe i'll change the lead a little bit add some extra layers but as soon as i've got that base idea because in big room it's really what listeners listen to is how catchy is the drop melody how nice are the sounds and then everything else is third most important to people in my opinion so when you've got the catchy melody you've got the nice sound it's it's edm but i think i made it fresh by bringing in the bass line as well when you've got all that everything else just becomes easy well for me uh, and i think everyone else who has been producing for like five plus years will also have that same feel where you get into like a rhythm and every track, you know, have that template in your head and you know where to go next. One of the things that you said I thought was really interesting is that you find that when you when you feel super inspired, you're able to just crank out the song just so much faster, so much high quality, come up with cool ideas. So do you have any anything set in, it's kind of set in place? Do you have any strategies to help you feel inspired, like certain techniques you use to help you feel inspired? 
I, I'm not sure I have any real techniques for me that inspire when I get this real inspired feeling. I, I don't get it often. I will I will say that. But when I make a really catchy melody, and it basically, if my manager, because my manager's he's an, a label A and R as well, so he's quite a tough nut to crack. So if he says this is sick. I'm like, boom, straight in the studio, wrap the song up instantly. But if he's like, it's cool, but then I'll be like, ah, you know, it's this day in it. So back to the drone board kind of thing. So if I get a good melody, then it's like my layer and my sound selection becomes better. I just spend more, I put more heart into the song. I really feel that. But if people do, because I think anyone watching this will probably make the same kind of music, you know, all in the EDM kind of sound. So if you're struggling to get those nice melodies, I would say to invest in some MIDI packs. MIDI packs have helped me massively. I've had like 12 piano lessons and it turns out I'm really bad at piano. So it's something that didn't really help me too much. But when I drag in a MIDI file, like you see that this track, Harrison gave me the basis of this melody. So everything else just boom, it happens. You know, melodies can take me two, three hours sometimes. The structure of the track, it's just, you get used to doing it so much. So if you can drag a melody in from a, a MIDI pack, royalty free, it might turn out to be, whoa, this is amazing. I want to make this, I want to do that. And then everything just flows. And from there, you can also learn which notes work well together. You know, the D and the B, for example, next time I make a track, I'm going to think, oh, these are going to sound nice together. That's, that is a really good, really, really good answer. So we did an episode with Mossy Man. Yeah. He basically said the same thing. He's like, my inspiration is directly tied to the melody, right? Because at the end of the day, the melody yeah. is the soul of the song. It is. There's no way exactly, around it. Yeah. And so if you take away that soul, you, you're taking a huge part of the creativity away. And I love that you said, go get some MIDI packs, man. Dude, there's so many yeah. resources now. Dude, if you if you don't want to have the time to go learn about music theory and you don't want to learn, exactly. like, what's the... Uh, the do I need to go to this note or that note? Well, you can just go grab a MIDI pack, drag it in. You can see the yeah. things that work, right? You can see the melodies that work. That you're like, oh, what is this melody? This really likes, oh, they're going from this note to this note. And you know, you're kind of, you're kind of like melody hacking at that point. Exactly. Um, it's a cheat code, I think. It's, it's a, a cheat, cheat code. code. I love it, dude. I think that's such a fantastic little hack. Another question that came up uh, from what you're saying. So you're saying in the song, you're combining elements of big room. And then you said, there's a few other genres that you said. I would say like a bit progressive house, a little bit future house as well. Here's a question. What is the difference? For those that are watching that don't know, what is the difference between Big Room and Progressive House? Let's start with those. What's the difference between those two? Big Room is the energy, right? It's usually a lot punchier of a kick. Like I would, I would say Big Room is more the festival kind of sound, especially years ago. It's like really boom, boom, boom. Progressive is a lot more based around the melody. Sounds are a lot softer. The kicks are very much softer. It's more radio friendly music. Both really great genres in their own right. I've been inspired by them both. You know, I had a really progressive melody. It was very catchy, has has emotion in it as well. So I wanted to have these like gritty sounds. Basically, I would say that the grittier sounds are more big room and the, the softer, more beautiful sounds are for progressive house. And then obviously I wanted to have that future house feel as well. So I added in the claps on the two and the four. So it's suddenly has this future house rhythm. I've done quite a lot of tracks, which are big room and progressive infused. Um, still trying to nail it. I still think it's a genre which could be really perfect together. It's just about finding the right sound and, and, and getting a really catchy melody as well. So then that beckons the next question, which is what is the difference between progressive house and future house? Th there's lots of different progressive house. You've got like the progressive house, which is what the older guys will assume is they will think it's more like the tech house kind of sound. It's, you know, like camel fat almost. People would say this is progressive house, but the progressive house that I relate to is the LSO sound, you know, Swedish house mafia, that softer, but like those really big melodies and stuff. But future house is more house music, but taking those catchy melodies. Progressive house doesn't have the this kind of rhythm in it as much or the hi-hats on the offbeat. It's more about just the four by four kick and these beautiful melodies. Whereas Future House is kind of taking pop melodies almost, that, that pop catchiness with EDM sounds to it. If you don't know what they are, I would look at Alesso for, for the Progressive House. Like back in the days, he was the king at that. And you've got guys like Mike Williams still doing doing Future House really well. But these genres are all always developing as well as, as time goes on. For sure. And there's a lot of crossover. So here's a, here's a question. What is the kind of example of a, of a big room song. I would say Tremor by Martin Garrix and Dimitri Vegas and Like Mike. That's the one I always say. I, I think this is becoming more popular again as well, this song. And then what is the crowning example of a progressive house song? I would say If I Lose Myself, Alesso and Ryan Tedder, I think. And now you know where I'm going with this. What is yeah. the crowning example of a future house song? This is tough because I like I listened to Future House. Back in the days, I would say anything by Mike Williams when he started putting out that really melodic future house. You know, you had the bouncy bob track from Martin Garrix, which 
blew everyone's mind. This was the, the first time someone took a, a EDM lead and put it with a, a baseline, a Future House baseline. So that blew everyone's mind. But from that, more melodic Future House came about. And I would say Mike Williams, anything by Mike Williams from a few years ago was really top quality Future House when it first came out. Another question I had from what we were going over here is how did how do you sidechain inside of FL Studio? As you'll know from what I said before with the MIDI files, I like simplicity. I like to work fast. So anything, any plugin with one or two buttons to it is like perfect for me. So what I like to use is probably already new, but this is by Nicky Romero. It's called Kickstart. As you can see, I don't have to, you know, I, I know there is plugins where you can shape your own sidechain, but I've never had any issues or any time where I've thought, yeah, this isn't enough. All of these presets, you've got classic chain, you've got really tight side chain like this one. The one I used is actually quite loose because a lot of the melody is on the kick. I didn't want to side chain it too much because I'll lose the power. It's I think it's crashed there. But yeah, th this is <laughs> this is massive because from here, if if you think oh maybe it's too tight still, what you can do is just turn this knob up and down. But unfortunately, my my FL Studio will have a heart attack if that happens. So what I like to do is a little tip if you have CPU issues is I would use this one, and you can basically have as much control over how tight or loose the the, the side chain is. But that's one of the most simple plugins and i love these kind of plugins nikki romero kickstart that's kind of like super cheap as well though. yeah man when it comes to like big room progressive house future house i feel like nikki romero's kickstart is just like the dream plugin because it's like 15 bucks it does exactly what you want it to do and it's stupid yeah. easy right yeah exactly like one button and you, you've got the side chain it just helps with it how quick you move in the studio as well like imagine me having to draw out this specific side chain with a volume shaper for example it's just it just wastes time do you throw this kickstart on every single element element of the drop that's not the kick or do you have it in a group or how does that work what i could do is group it but for me uh i'm very old school i, I produce the same way i produced when i first picked up fl studio i find something that works and i just stick to it even though you know my ignorance would say that i would have to try and progress but when i know how to do something i want to keep doing that over and over again Wh whichever element it is you know you can see i've got this the the kickstart always i put it at the end because my reverbs and everything i want to be side chained as well i don't want the side chain to be just you know playing around swinging around out there while the leads really side chain tight so i always put it at the end so now the next thing that you were saying is basically you take the drop that you have and you duplicate it over to the intro and then start stripping things away right yeah you can see it's pretty much identical right but this is the thing a lot of people message me on instagram always like yo i'm stuck on my intro and outro i'm like how if you listen to all edm songs it's always the drop minus some elements right this is just the drop but with the bass line going in one complete note, the, the bass line of the song, as you can see, it's just one long note. It's not, doesn't develop until later on. So all I have is these elements. I would say always have your kick drum, obviously. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not a rule, but it's it's nice for the DJ who's going to play the track to be able to kick drum, mix in a kick drum. So kick drum, claps, little bit of effects, don't go too over the top. And I would start, an easy tip is to filter up your drop lead. You can just filter it up gradually. You'll hear that in a lot of the old, like, Alesso kind of tracks. The, the elements I've taken out is not too much, actually, but you will hear that it's a lot different to the drop. But then in the second section, things start to heat up a little bit. It starts progressing, believe it or not. Because as a DJ myself, you know, I've been lucky enough to play over the past few years, and this is when I start to mix the other song out and this one in. So the bass of this song comes up, the bass of the other song comes down. So this one needs to be more energetic and it really needs to let the crowd know that there's a new song coming into the mix. So I added some stuff, I believe. Yeah, for example, this. <laughs> Only one thing different from the drop, I guess. But just a shout out to Kashmir, just the easiest, greatest little loops that you can just drag and drop. And as long as you layer them up together, it's it's not going to sound like, oh, that guy used this loop. Because a lot of people like to just drag a Kashmir sound in and that's it. I would recommend that you try and why not take two or three and layer them together? Why not? It's just going to show that it's more your own rather than just doing what everyone else is doing.
But as you can hear, now I've brought in the bit, the melody, the bass line changes, the lead is starting to be filtered up even more so you can you can hear the melody even more. And some rises as well. You've got to try and move the track along in the smoothest way possible. And that's pretty much it. As you can see, I've just copy and pasted, took some elements out of the first part, brought most of them back in for the second part. And nobody has ever, in, in the five years I've been releasing, releasing on the top labels, no one's once complained about my intros. So you can take that from me as gospel. You can you can do it. So going along with this whole intro talk, what is what is like kind of protocol with making an intro and an outro that is DJ friendly? As you can see here, it's 17 bars. This is 30 seconds, right? You can see here that it'll go to 30 seconds. Pretty much 30 seconds, right? This in EDM, you know, I think most EDM DJs can DJ with their eyes shut because every intro is 30 seconds, every outro is 30 seconds. You wait until the outro comes, you, you hit the play button. So 30 seconds for an EDM song, I think is perfect. You don't want the, especially when it's on Spotify and stuff, even the extended mix, you don't want people falling asleep whilst the intro is going. You know, back in the days, as I said about Alesso, Alesso's intros were this long, one minute. So he would start here with just a kick and a clap. And then in this part, he would bring in in some hi-hats in this part you would bring the bass line in this part you would bring like a snare like a build-up snare those days are gone because now dj sets require that you mix 35 40 songs in an hour in the past you could play 12 songs in an hour so as the times progressed i think all of us producers have just shortened the intro cut, cut the cut the bull basically and, and just get straight into it and it makes the track more more energetic as well because you're leaving out that just kick a clap you're getting a lot of the elements in so I would try and stick to 30 seconds if it's this genre, but you know, trap's different. Every BPM is different, but for, for this kind of music, it's got to have a kick drum, whether it's a four by four or whatever pattern your drop is, whether it's a trap pattern, you want the DJ to be able to mix the kick drum to the other kick drum rather than them having to guess, you know, that's pretty much it. You can be as creative. You can make the intro any way you want it, but if you're struggling with your intros and you're struggling to get tracks finished because of them, just do what I do because it saves you a lot of time. And by the way, if you, if you are struggling to find any Anything for the intro. What I do is I take synth loops from a sample pack, like lots of sample packs do construction kits. So they'll make a drop and stem every individual part. I'll take the drop loop and just chop it up and pitch it, uh, chop it up and filter it up. And then it fills up most of the intro. So another little tip, a little cheat there for you. So the the section that is between the intro and the drop, uh, that can be considered either the, the verse and the build. Is that is that what we got going on? Yeah. 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 So what's going on there? In the breakdown, it's it's pretty much, I have to give Harrison credit to this. As you can see, this is all stems from, I think he uses logic. So he has this pad. <laughs> which I think is like super poppy. Like this was, he put his heart and soul into this track. He wanted it to still have the pop elements because he wants it to be commercially successful. And it, it, it is doing well on Spotify still, which is I think a big part because of the breakdown. It is very pop friendly. The plucks also. <laughs> So this is, this is a, a very poppy feel to me. And that's basi basically it. And then we do bring in the bass line. And obviously the vocal, which I, sh I should have played anyway, but with the vocal, it does sound like this. So that's what we had from the breakdown, but we got the feedback from Revealed that they said, said it was just too empty. There was nothing going on. So then I had to go in the cashmere pack and find some EDM, EDM AF samples and just drag them in. So I got the, the, the standard drop claps in there. It's already filling up the mix a tiny bit more. So in addition to that, I needed to add another pad of Eventually they said, you know, it just needs one more element to fill it up because it's a little bit empty still. So I brought in this pad. And I just filtered it up because I didn't want it to be in straight away because I love the feel of the pop breakdown. I just wanted to bring them in slightly. It's a Future House sample pack preset called Wobble Chords. They are slightly wobbling, like tremolo kind of thing. So yeah, that, that's pretty much it as far as the breakdown. He, he has these trombones, these like brass noises. I'm not giving up no love tonight. 
But unfortunately, it, it is a club record, so we needed to do something in this part to up the energy. And the easiest way to do that is to add a kick drum, a four by four kick drum. It's instantly gonna, instantly gonna drive on the track. So what this is, is a big cashmere clap layered with a snare. And this is a tech house kick. I didn't want to have something too sharp. I wanted to leave the, the real EDM sounds to the drop only. So this is like a round kick, which it doesn't really shine through the mix too much, but it does drive the track onwards. And then we go in, into the build-up. It changes slightly in the second break. Harrison, he, he called me and he said, the second breakdown, I think we should go for just the kick and the vocal or, or something like that. So I had to get a sharper kick, like a more EDM kick. Which is really great for a club because from my experience, you know, the big, the big synthy breakdowns are great. As soon as you bring a kick drum into that synthy breakdown, <laughs> the crowd start clapping, you know, that the, the energy is increased. The good thing about this song, it has two breakdowns which do that, so you could play two breakdowns in a set successfully, I, I believe. That's pretty much the break. But I mean, is there, is there any other like big uh, sections that we really need to cover? This one uh, in the second breakdown, something had to be different. So this was the part where I really did me. I just did, did, did my sounds. I, I'll play it first and I'll explain. This is like selfishly for my own shows where, you know, I, I can interact with the crowd, you know, I can get them to clap along, all that kind of thing. It was really simple. All I had to do was make this little fake build up. I had to make it so it didn't confuse the crowd. I didn't want to make it this long 15 second build up where the crowd expect a drop and I just go into a synth with no kick. It's just going to kill the vibe. It had to be a sneaky little, a, a little build up. So I went for quite a, a short drum fill. Shout out Kashmir again. filled it up as well and as you can see that's just straight from his sample pack but I have chopped it a little bit to suit my own needs. We have some impact samples which let you know that something else is coming. And then I vocoded his vocal. Which, which I would love to show you, but it's in another project. I actually learned how to do this by searching how to do the Daft Punk vocoding. And some guy, some some young kid had done a tutorial in like 2008 or something and showed how to do it. It's very simple in FL Studio, but I have a project now. So I just run to that project, put the vocal in, vocode it and bounce it back in. That's why it's bounced in as vocal later Harrison. Leah Harrison. And then I, I, I delayed his vocal as well. And I think that's a, like a perfect transition. And then I've got some other stuff, you know, the bass, some reverse synths, which can also help with the, the, the transition. I took the the saws, which play the same pattern as the drop lead. So the dun, 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 but playing the chords of the melody. So these work, I actually, actually modified these a little bit myself, but they work well with the drop leads. So what I did was I reversed the sound. I basically bounced it as one long sound like this with a lot of reverb, like super wet reverb. Click the reverse button and suddenly you have this reverse sound, which helps you transition into the drop leads like this. Again, you know, you can use other reverse sounds for this, but if you want something to sound really organic and smooth, I would use the actual leads that you're going to transition into. Draw one long note and, you know, it's, it's a simple technique, but it can really help your tracks transition because transitioning is really important, I think, in these kind of tracks when you're doing different things like this. That's pretty much this section. <laughs> So 
So yeah, I think the, the build-up's a little bit different as well. I mean, I can show you it quickly. It's just that this, this build-up had to be different. I wanted it to be a little bit longer. This is my breakdown, you know, that which suits my sets more. And I think the first breakdown suits his sets more. So I think we've both got to put our stamp on these. You're moving too fast, and I don't think it's right. I'm not giving you my love tonight. tonight, 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 tonight. So here we have the vocal pitching up, but in the first break, uh, build up, build up, we have this. So both are different, and I think uh, labels really appreciate that as well. This one was a really basic one. So I think it's it's good inspiration for producers who are quite new to it. And I know this looks crazy. If I worked a lot cleaner, it would be a lot less intimidating for you, I guarantee. But you can see how I'm using like four layers. I'm using Camel Crusher. You know, I'm using the basic stuff, but you will get there in the end. The final question yeah. that I have for you is, what is something that is inside music production? It could be sound design, it could be melody, it could be like music theory stuff, it could be mixing, it could be mastering, it could like like the entire spectrum of music production. What is a subject that you want to know more about or a question that you have right now about music production that you don't know, but you want to know? The whole of mastering, the whole section, everything. As I said before, you know, I'm, I'm a simple producer. I like the simple things. The reason I make such good music is because I'm very creative. I'm not the wizard in the studio. I'm not the guy who's like how do you do all this stuff i'm just very creative like as a kid i was very creative as well so i think that's kind of carried me even though I, i'm really bad with technology really bad with their uh, computers and stuff so people always ask like what's on your master chain and as you can see the master chain right now <laughs> i've got the endless smile which i love for for build-ups this is an edm cheap plugin again as you can see one button and what this does, it has a reverb, it has stereo imaging, it has delays in it, everything. So I have that on the master chain because I like to use the reverb on everything in the build-up. You can see it here. I just put it up to about 40% or something. I always use that on the build-ups to get that EDM feel. And then I've got some EQs. You know, I felt like the, the highs were lacking a little bit. And then this final EQ is something I always do. Anything under like 35 hertz, depends on the keys that you're using, but anything under here is just unnecessary it's just bad sound so i like to just completely cut everything from the master and the same for the highs if there's anything too sharp doesn't need to be there it's just going to be cut off but i will say this track was mastered by revealed and revealed hardwell masters some of the, the best masters i've ever heard you know i was lucky with that one and it's something i've tried to learn myself but i've never got to that that hardwell master level you know so it's always it's always pushed me back i've always been looking for a really simple a simple mastering way because i pr i produce with so much power anyway you know i've got the, the compression in the actual leads. I've got compression on, on the bass lines, whatever. You just camel crush it to get that power there. So the final 5% that mastering gives, I really want to learn that as well so I can be in control of my masters rather than relying on a label, for example. Donation, comment below. What yeah. do you think is some really good mastering techniques? Do you know any resources? Do you know anything Perfect. like that? So that all you yes. can take is music even to the next level, even, to the, even higher where you are right now. Did you have a good time? Yeah, it was a lot of fun, man. Thank you for having me on. Absolutely, dude. What's up, Don Nation? Did you enjoy that? Did you learn a lot? Now, listen, don't head out yet because there's a few things that we need to talk about before this episode ends okay but really quick before i get to those i would like to remind you to head on down hit the subscribe button hit that little notification bell as well as go ahead and hit the like button as hard as you want you have my full permission just to slap that bad boy and also to leave a comment down in the comment section i would love to know whether you like this video whether you didn't like this video whatever i just love to know what your thoughts are on this whole thing okay so with that being said let's talk about these extra pieces of value that we have for you that are going to really really help you out in your music production journey. Now, you are on In The Daw right now. We also have another series called Behind The Dot. That series lives over here on the YouTube series. It also lives over on our podcast, which by the way, you can partake of all of our content over on the podcast. But Behind The Dot is where we focus more on the emotional, philosophical, and music business side, okay? We interview not only huge music producers, but we interview music industry experts, singers, songwriters, sound designers, and everyone else in between. So over here on In The Dot, it's more technical, mixing, mastering, sound design, you know, things of that nature. Nature. And then over on Behind the Dot, it's more about the emotional, philosophical realm, the music business realm, so on and so forth. So if you're interested in that, go ahead. They're, they're on the channel. They're the purple videos on the channel. You can also check those out over on the Daw Nation podcast, which you can check out on Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, Deezer, everywhere that there's basically an app where you can partake of podcasts. Behind the Daw is over there on the Daw Nation podcast. Another piece of value that I have for you is our courses. Now, you've been partaking of our free content, which is totally dope. This is really 
really, really good content. But if you really want to take your music production to a whole new level, I would highly encourage you to go over to dawnation.net and check out our courses over there. Currently, we have two of them. The first one, which this episode is sponsored by, is the Zodiac Masterclass. Now, if you don't know who Zan Griffin is, he's an absolutely amazing producer. When he was 19 years old, he got an album signed to Seeking Blue, which you know has had people like Millennium, Seven Lions, Head Sky, people of that nature, and it went on to get over a hundred million streams. That album is called the Zodiac Album, and we broke down every single song inside of that album. Okay, so you see everything. There's literally everything is out on the table so that you can learn how to make an album that got over a hundred million streams. Like the work is already done. All right, it's a tried and proved method that these songs work. So if you want to learn how to make those, head on over to dawnation.net. Check out the Zodiac Masterclass. It's amazing. Currently, it's 50% off. Okay, so I'd highly encourage you to go check that out. You also get project files, stems, freaking bonus presets. It's insane. Just go check it out. You're going to love it. Second thing that we have is the school of bass. Now, if you're a big sound design person, you really want to take your sound design skills to the next level. We did a course called the school of bass with AU5, who's just an absolute sound design legend. We've had over a thousand people sign up for it. It's, it's, it's absolutely insane. So if you want to go check that out you can head on over to dawnation.net, you can check that out over there as well. So Daw Nation, with all this being said, I really hope that you enjoyed this week's episode of In The Daw. And if you did, again, Go ahead and subscribe, hit the notification bell, like, comment, as well as I would love for you to take a screenshot and tag me and Ollie James over on an Instagram story, all right? Our Instagram handles will be up on the screen right now. Thanks to Ben. You good man. And then sometime probably within the next 20 seconds or so, there's going to be pop-ups on the screen where you can subscribe to the channel, check out our latest piece of content, watch all the In The Daw and Behind The Daw episodes. It's going to be great. Go ahead and click on those as well. As well as make sure to keep checking back here every couple days. We're always releasing new content. We always have stuff coming out. So make sure to keep on coming back here as well, okay? But for sure, make sure to come back here next week because we are releasing a new episode of Behind The Daw with Prince Fox. That one's going to be really, really, I mean like really good, okay? So make sure to come back for that one. With that being said, Donation, have a fantastic day, and we'll see you next week.